Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you. We're happy to start right on time because Senator Feingold insisted. He is very timely, very punctual, unlike me. So I'm, I'm delighted to welcome my good friend, former Senator Russ Feingold to the University of Virginia. I was pleased to be with him and his wonderful colleagues and students at Yale just two weeks ago. And I threatened my students with that because those Yale students were so, so sharp. And I could see the grade curve declining. And uh, they were very concerned when I tweeted that. And so they're all here voluntarily. Senator Feingold said, were they forced to come? I said, absolutely not. Because we're getting very near grading season. And it's, it's amazing what they will do, Russ, near grading season. You know, because they know you'll remember long enough to the, to the grading period. But that's not why they're here. They're here because they wanted to see you and there was a lot of excitement about your coming. Uh, Russ Feingold is the Martin R. F is it Flug? You don't know either. <laughs> you don't know either. All right, it's the, he's the Martin R. Flug uh, visiting professor in the practice of law at Yale Law School. He, he was a U.S. Senator from Wisconsin from 1993 to 2011. And before that, he was a Wisconsin State Senator from 1983 to 1993. We're going to talk about your campaigns and elections uh, when we have dinner at Pavilion 4 with the lucky students in campaigns and elections who are getting an incredible meal tonight because of you. Okay, so I just want them to know that ahead of time. But I still remember when Russ, um, you were elected state senate not long after you finished law school. You went to Harvard Law School, went back to Wisconsin, and I, I still remember when you ran, I think for the senate, he converted his uh, garage door into a list of campaign promises. This was a low budget shoestring campaign and it took off. This was in 1992, but we wanna talk about the campaigns tonight. But that kind of gives you a sense uh, that Russ is a populist, which he is, and he's gonna talk about populism in this era, among other things. Anyway, back to the, back to the script here. After he left the Senate during uh, President Obama's term, uh, he was, from 2013 to 2015, the U.S. Special Envoy to the Great Lakes region of Africa and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And that must have been fascinating. Uh, Senator Feingold uh, is known for many, many things. I think he's known especially for his work alongside Republican Senator John McCain. Bipartisan effort. Those are dead, you know. There's no, there's no, you know President Trump has not a single Democrat coming to the state dinner tonight because they would poison the dinner, and everyone knows that. Uh, so nobody's coming. But back then, it was actually legitimate to have bipartisan efforts. And he worked very closely with Senator McCain on the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act of 2002, better known as McCain-Feingold. And he was way ahead of his time. Look how much worse it's gotten. Every single year, it's gotten worse. Recently read that in Florida, the Senate race this next year is estimated to cost the Senate one Senate seat. $200 million for one Senate seat. I'm trying to guess which is the first billion dollar Senate seat. It's coming, it's coming. Uh, so he was way ahead of himself and he'll maybe talk a little bit about that. Uh, and he got ahead of all of us on campaign finance. He was absolutely right and, and Senator McCain was right with him. Then the one that I like to point to, uh, he was the sole vote in the United States Senate against the Patriot Act. And how can you vote against something called the Patriot Act? That's, that's got to be a killer politically. But he did it because it was the right thing to do. And suddenly all these other senators and politicians have discovered provisions in the Patriot Act, both Democrats and Republicans, that have not been helpful uh, to the country and to our relationships uh, domestically and internationally. And Russ saw it that day and he had the courage to stand up and vote no and take all the criticism uh, that came with it. Uh, in addition to his congressional and diplomatic career, Senator Feingold has, listen to this, has taught or lectured at Stanford University, Stanford Law School, Lawrence University, Marquette University Law School, American University, Beloit College, and I think Harvard is in your future too. You're planning on, on uh, joining there, and he's up at Yale right now um, living in uh, Benjamin Franklin College, one of the two new colleges at Yale, and, and uh, is highly prized there, as I, as I learned. He holds a BA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, a BA and an MA from 
the University of Oxford where, as a Rhodes Scholar, where I first got to, got to know Russ, and we did some traveling through Europe, and we were, we were in Tel Aviv the day that Menachem Begin was first sworn in as Prime Minister. That's how old you are, Russ. That's how old you are. I was, I was a child then, and you were supervising my care, but I do remember that. And, and of course, he got his JD from Harvard Law School. Anyway, I could go on and on because he's a dear friend. I am a very, very fond of him. I am proud of him. He has always been there and stood up and was counted. And uh, we always will be proud of you, Russ. So ladies and gentlemen, please give Senator Professor Feingold a warm Virginia welcome. Thank you, Professor. Uh, it's very kind of you to be willing to get, let somebody who apparently can't keep a job. Uh, <laughs> listen to that list, I thought, goodness. Um, anyway, this is a thrill to be here. I've never been in this room. What a, what a moving thing to, to first come. I've been on the campus a few times, but this is a deeply moving thing. And uh, I'll tell you, I think the world of your Professor Sabato here Yes, we did meet in Oxford many years ago. Uh, all I wanted to talk about was the Wisconsin progressive political tradition, and all he wanted to talk about was Virginia and Henry Howell. And he sang the Henry Howell song on, the, on High Street in Oxford on a regular basis. So uh, we all, you know, as I was saying up at, uh, when he gave a speech for us a few, couple weeks ago, when we, were, when we were young guys, um, every state had its own distinct politics, traditions, uh, and there were a varieties of views in a state like this in Wisconsin, and it wasn't this nationalized, one-size-fits-all sort of angry politics. So that was great front, fun, meeting Americans and people from other countries, but especially Americans who shared the political traditions of their states, and, and they were... Uh, you know, traditions that actually lived up to this idea of the states as, as laboratories for democracy, uh, that it could be a very positive thing that different states were trying to do different things. So I remember that from Professor Sabato. Over the years, I admired enormously his dedication to this university and this program. I mean, obviously, the key person. And whenever I meet anybody who went to UVA, of course, my first question is, did you have Professor Sabato? Yes, of course I did. And, and then when I was working in some of these environments you described, one of my top two aides at the State Department, a guy named Brennan Gilmore, of course, UVA man. Uh, when, when I hired a, my legislative director at one of the key points in my uh, career uh, in the United States Senate, Tom Walls, who's running your Sorensen uh, program here. So UVA people all the time, and almost every one of them has had the benefit of, of learning uh, from you. The other thing about Professor Sabato, he knows how to be objective. We're friends, but whenever he had to, in his crystal ball, talk about any of my races, he was always very objective. And I could never, uh, even though he predicted one time that I was going to lose, uh, I thought I was too, <laughs> so I wasn't mad, and I did lose. <laughs> this time we both thought we were, I was going to win, he thought I was going to win, we were both wrong. But the point is, is that he's a total professional as well. And I just want to take my hat off to this university. I mean, you've had a rough year. Uh, I happen to have been here. Uh, my wife gave a lecture here last year in Rare Books uh, area. Uh, and I went to say hi to Larry. And it was just two weeks uh, before this horrific series of events here. I want you to know the rest of the country admires this place tremendously. Uh, we are proud of you uh, standing against the forces that intruded on this campus. And uh, I am just. Uh, personally very grateful to be here to say that. So I sort of entitled this thing a, a new, the uh, Taking on Populist uh, Plutocracy. And uh, you know it sort of rings true for me that what's going on in this country right now at the local and state and federal level uh, really bears no relationship at all to the democracy that I grew up to believe in. And, and I wouldn't have even said that two years ago. It is an astonishing turn of events. And some people are trying to point out, even though there are elements of populism, I had to do a conference uh, at Oxford, for a sort of international conference on fears of populism. And I said, look, to, to me as a badger from Wisconsin, the land of Bob LaFala, populism is not a dirty word in and of itself. It is not. Populism can be a very good thing. 
Populism was the key driving of the progressive movement, which we revere in my state and many parts of the, of the Midwest. But when it is a populist plutocracy, that's a little different. And that's a sort of based on language that's being used by people like Fareed Zakari and Paul Krugman, where there is sort of a populist veneer, but what's really driving it is the power of very wealthy individuals and corporations that don't want to believe in, don't want you to take climate change seriously, that want to sell cigarettes, uh, and that want to be able to um, cut their taxes to virtually nothing. So in a way, this sort of populist aspect, which of course does translate into votes, is in a way sort of like uh, what we call astroturf when we were in the uh, United States Senate, which is, you know, you used to get a lot of letters from people, handwritten letters before emails and all that, and all of a sudden you start getting thousands of identical generated notes from people. We called that, instead of grassroots, astroturf. And that is what we're getting. You know, it looks populist, but it is not. It is really the opposite of what you think populism would be, is fighting for the average person. This instead is doing the bidding of the moneyed interest that has been particularly unleashed in the last few years. And I say in the last few years very pointedly because a lot of people are seeing all of this in the eyes of what has happened in the last two years. I take it back to about 2009 and 2010. And frankly, when President Obama was sworn in, I noticed there was a bizarre and extreme reaction uh, in my state where I did town meetings in every county every single year. He hadn't even been even sworn in yet. And people were saying, he's going to do this, he's a socialist, he's going to do that. People that I'd never seen before who seemed uh, extremely angry. And so what began there with the Tea Party had a lot of electoral results in 2010, of course. We lost the Congress, but something else happened. At the same time, in the same year, the Supreme Court issued the Citizens United decision that took the lid off of campaign spending and it could be hidden. And so what I see as happening at that point is a fusion of the Tea Party electoral successes with the goals of these very wealthy plutocrats and they got their way. You know, the Tea Party people were not in the streets calling for overturning the law that Teddy Roosevelt signed saying that corporations should be able to give unlimited campaign contributions. That was nothing to do with the Tea Party agenda. They were co-opted. They were taken for a ride by these brilliant, manipulative, powerful interests. And so, in 2016, in November, I had a lot of time on my hands, uh, <laughs> sitting at, looking at the woods near my house, and I thought, what, what is really going on here? And uh, I created a group called Legit Action, based on the, the word legitimacy. And I realized a number of key institutions of our democracy have been under assault well before Donald Trump. And it appears that they will be under assault after Donald Trump as well. That doesn't mean that isn't serious, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But these assaults go back to about 2009, 2010. Number one, the attack on the right to vote. These voter ID laws, making sure that Felons who have served their time can't, can't, can't vote for their life. The bizarre reapportionment, which of course was very severe in Wisconsin, is the subject of a court case before the Supreme Court, uh, limiting early voting, you name it, uh, an unprecedented attack on the right to vote. I, try, I can assure you, after my 28 years in public office, that was not a partisan thing ever. Republicans, I know, wouldn't have been caught dead trying to be said that they were trying to prevent people from voting. So that's the first one. Second one was campaign finance reform. Professor Sabato already pointed this out. This was an area, at least uh, when John McCain and I were working together, that was seen as bipartisan. And it wasn't just the two of us. We had a nice group of senators on both sides. And that's one of the reasons pe people really took note of the fact that we did campaign finance reform on a bipartisan basis. And so what did they do? The corporations and others didn't like it, that we were actually getting things done, and we, we had changed the system, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. So they engineered this decision that allows these unlimited campaign contributions. So first the right to vote, then our campaign finance system is attacked before Donald Trump. The third thing, I didn't used to feel this way, the Electoral College. You know, when I was in uh, high school, I went to a, a, a debate institute. You know, I was one of these guys that I wanted to be a debater, so I went. And, 
you know, I went over to Eau Claire, Wisconsin for three weeks, and, and the teacher was this wonderful nationally uh, known uh, debate coach. She was about this tall, she's the toughest thing you've ever seen, and she had, had a lisp, but she said, when she spoke, she said, I will teach you to always slip them the blade nicely. <laughs> that was her motto, which I love. But we had to do a paper for the course. So I go over to the library and I write sort of laughingly about this thing called the Electoral College that you know, once determined an election, <laughs> even though somebody didn't get a majority of the votes. And uh, I never dreamed that in the in sort of critical part of my career and all of our professional lives, that two out of three of the last times, somehow the person that didn't get the most votes didn't become president. So I've changed my view on this. I think it's time to abolish the Electoral College. This is an institution uh, that, uh, frankly, helped this gentleman become president. Uh, but I think it is time uh, for it to go. So that's the third. And the fourth institution that we try to point out has been compromised is the United States Supreme Court. Of all the things that I've seen in politics, the thing that, that gets at me the most is the idea that even though no one would have ever thought of pulling this stunt before, that President Obama gets his right to pick a justice that could determine the future of the Supreme Court and the Republican Senate refuses to do its constitutional duty. They stole the Supreme Court. They stole the Supreme Court. And I'm not going to spend a lot of my time on this today, but don't ever forget that. That's what was done. And so the point here is to look at all these things and not get too hung up on the idea that this is about Donald Trump. Now, I don't know what's going to happen with Donald Trump. These things happened before him. They'll happen after he's gone. You know, maybe, maybe Donald Trump will be, end up being a, a bizarre footnote or one of the darkest chapters in our political history. Uh, he's, he is the face now, the face now of the fake populist facade that's enabling all of this, but he's not the whole story. Uh, so don't get me wrong. His attacks on immigrants, warmongering, his, his remarks uh, uh, about Latino judges, you know, whatever it might be, are absolutely horrific. But it's not the whole story. In fact, uh, what I try to title this, this speech sometimes as is, is, is you know, taking on pop, the populist protocracy, don't, don't get distracted by the shiny orange object. <laughs> you know, it's like he, he does perform that function of causing you to look over here all the time, being frustrated all the time, trying to decide how much, how off, how much TV you should have on, but all this other stuff is going on. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, I'm from the same town as Paul Ryan. Or I knew his father, and my, my father and his father uh, were in the same law building, the big, big law building in James, Wisconsin. My dad had the smaller firm, one guy. They had the big firm, five guys, you know. <laughs> so, you know, I've always gotten along with him. But I heard somebody say the other day, you know, just, just how far will these Republicans that are running this country go uh, to do, to get their agenda. Somebody even said, and forgive me for saying this here, they said, uh, are tax cuts worth Charlottesville, was one phrase. Well, we get the, yeah, maybe there's a racist, horrible, uh, anti-Semitic and other things going on, on on the UVA campus, but at least we're getting our tax cuts. It's a deal with the devil. And that is exactly uh, how this looks to me, because they have decided uh, to go along with it, and uh, in the case of Mr. Ryan and others, to not seriously challenge uh, what the president is doing because they are so hell-bent uh, on this agenda. So, you know, there are a few things that people say are, are the, the real reasons all of this is occurring uh, or have to do with the, with the answers, but, you know, I, I'm going to say there are a few things that, that people uh, focus on that I'm not sure are the main things. So I sort of call this not so much. And, and, and one is, you know, a lot of the work that's being done now in sociology and political science and others is to try to understand the Trump voter. You know, what, what is going on? Why do people who, some of them voted for Obama, why are they voting for Trump now? 
And there's some wonderful work being done on this, obviously, the Hillbilly Elegy and the work uh, by professors at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, that uh, Catherine Kramer. Um, there's a lot of literature, uh, a woman named Arlie Huxchild, who I admire enormously, she spent years in Louisiana with people, conservative people in rural areas trying to understand where they're coming from. And I think this is important work. Uh, I think it's work that needs to be done in the academic world. Um, but I'm not sure that it is the way to, for Democrats and progressives to turn this around. I think if you try to, to, to convince these individuals to, to, that they're wrong and that they shouldn't do this and they shouldn't talk this way, um, you can try, but I don't think it's gonna work very easy. I think what you wanna do is to try to in, involve uh, the majority of people in this country, many of whom are being disenfranchised one way or another, economically, racially, or otherwise. I think it is a more fruitful proposition to focus on broadening the vote and, and, to, and we of course hope that everybody will come along. But to rely on this uh, fickle notion that, that individuals who uh, say that they, that they need to have a completely different agenda with somebody like Donald Trump, somebody who's willing to vote for Donald Trump, I'm sorry. That to me is, is, is an awful lot of effort for something that I don't think is, is likely to succeed. Uh, and, and that's important because you only have so much energy. Uh, actually, you did a great job here in Virginia from my point of view. Fantastic. Uh, but you didn't, you didn't spend your time just trying to convert people who were so angry and so anti-government and so unwilling to listen to the facts. You focused on getting different people to vote. And I think that may be the answer. The second thing that I don't think is, is the answer necessarily is some people blame uh, the role of the political parties and partisanship, that everything has to do with one party versus another. Uh, but I want you to just think about whether it really is the political parties in the sense in which we, many of us, grew up thinking about political parties. In my view, uh, the political parties are not very strong anymore. The political parties are actually, to me, conduits uh, that are controlled mostly by these heavy-duty, wealthy interests. So it, it's not like frankly, the Democratic Party in Wisconsin or Minnesota is calling the shots. Others are calling the shots for them. Robert Rice re recently was asked about the role of the Democratic Party, and he said, uh, there, he said, the Democratic Party, there's no there there. It's just a big fundraising machinery. The real energy, the core, the heart of the Democratic Party, to the, to the extent there is one, is at the grassroots. And I would submit it's not really party-oriented. I've attended a couple of political science conferences recently where there's all this talk back and forth about political parties, but finally, uh, younger people, often uh, African-American, others stand up and say, you know, this isn't where the action is. It's not with the political parties. It's, with, it's in the communities. It's with the community groups. That's where the real energy is. And frankly, this year, with the uh, Me Too movement and with the anti-gun movement, these are not political party movements, but they are movements that are powerful and that can really change the attitude of the American people. So I would say uh, a second point is to not get too hung up on the role political parties. The third thing is, is of course I, I generally agree that more democracy is better, but let's not jump off the deep end and think that it's always better to just have the majority rule. Uh, this is not something that uh, is always intuitive to people, but I watched in both the state senate and the U.S. Senate for many years you know, a lot of times people, a majority of people, are ready to do things that uh, dismiss civil liberties, criminal defendants' rights, uh, intervene militarily. It's very easy often to get a majority for those kinds of things. And if you don't require on some occasions that, uh, that there be uh, some kind of protection against that, I think it can be a mistake. So no, I don't think the filibuster is a great thing. I also don't think it's an awful thing. I think it depends. I think it's actually probably a mistake to get rid of the filibuster for all the judgeships because that means 51 votes he can put anybody it's what Trump's going to get to fill all these Obama judgeships with 51 votes that was the Democrats mistake to do that but when it comes to legislation I don't think it's so terrible that a super majority is required John McCain and I understood that it took us eight years we always understood it would take 60 votes but my favorite story of remembering this, and although I do think the filibuster is greatly abused, and there are many reforms that can be made, but after the Republicans took over 
uh, in the famous contract with America election in 1994, where I went from being sort of the 57th Democrat to the 45th Democrat. My, my seat ended up near what's called the candy drawer in the Senate uh, because uh, I lost a lot, of, a lot of seniority. But you know, I was a new senator and uh, it was only my third year there and uh, my chief of staff says to me, Ted Kennedy needs you on the floor right away. You gotta get down there and give a talk. They were trying to repeal the Davis-Bacon labor law. So I get down there and Senator Kennedy sees, oh, I see our distinguished, brilliant young senator from Wisconsin is here and he's going to address you now on this. And so I start reading my speech that, that uh, I was give, given. You know, I, sometimes I talked extemporaneously and sometimes the speeches were handed to me. And, and uh, you know, so I start talking away and I finish after about five minutes and Kennedy's not paying any attention to me, he's just talking to his staff. You know, this was a break for him because he was running this thing. And I stopped and he goes, what are you doing? <laughs> Keep talking. I said, I don't have anything else to say. He said, we don't care what you say. This is a filibuster. Just talk. <laughs> uh, so th I didn't mind being scolded by one of my heroes. But, um, you know, they were trying to get rid of all the environmental and labor laws that had been worked so hard on for 40 to 50 to years or longer. So uh, there are probably too many veto points in the system, as they say. Um, the idea that you can have a filibuster that isn't even really a filibuster, that is silent, that's just talking, is not, that's just filing a, a motion, that should go. But I would say that the answer to our problems is not making the process uh, too easy because of some of the things that can happen. I mean, I was a state legislator and, you know, sometimes things can move very quickly. The process isn't automatically a barrier. For example, I remember once when there was a resolution introduced for the Girl, Girl Scout Cookie Week. That thing passed really fast. You know, the same rules, the same procedure. That isn't the key, just the procedure. And finally, before I talk about some of the things we can do to maybe turn this around, um, you might find it a little surprising I say this because my name is sometimes synonymous with campaign finance reform. In fact, one of John McCain's seven jokes that he told uh, <laughs> O over and over was, ah, in Wisconsin, people think Feingold's first name is McCain. You know, he, he thought that was just a wonderful joke. Um, but I would say that with unlimited contributions by wealthy individuals and money in moneyed interests, um, the issue is not so much who has the most money to win an election. It's what happens the day after the election. Excuse me, actually the day after you're sworn in. See, when there's this kind of money swimming around, it sort of creates barriers so that nobody's going to touch certain things. And both sides basically become immobilized to take on things, for example, like pharmaceutical drug costs. I mean, there, this ad on TV now, have you seen this one? There, everybody, everybody who takes any medicine from Canada dies, you know. <laughs> it's just ridiculous, horrible stuff, but people are, it's of course not true, it's paid for by these interest groups. There is a closing and constricting of the legislative process because this kind of money dominates the electoral process. So that, that I think it's important to think because you, know, you can say Trump didn't have the most money. That's not the issue. It's that when you have unlimited contributions, it scares people and they become afraid to legislate in the way that their constituents really want them to do. So how do we get beyond this? Uh, what can we do at this point, besides the obvious, which is the upcoming 2018 elections, which I think are going to be very exciting, and there is tons of uh, activity going on all over this country. But there, I'd make three points. As devastating as the reversals have been in the last few years, many of the losses have been very close and are ultimately reversible. Secondly, don't give up on regenerating bipartisanship. Third, innovate, organize, and support state and local initiatives. First, as to things being close. Some of, some of my friends get tired of my glass half full uh, attitude, which has been greatly challenged in the last few years, but you know, it seems like Democrats and liberals are, are quick to despair and slow to recover for the next round. There's, a, there's sort of a woe is me, uh, as opposed to the old Cubs mantra until they won the World Series, wait till next year. Uh, it, it, you know, we need to get a little better at having a longer view. We forget how close some of these losses have been. I mean, most obviously is what I've already mentioned. 
uh, you know, these guys, George Bush and, and, and Donald Trump, didn't really become president very, by much of a margin or any margin at all. The elections were ridiculously co close. They could have gone any other way. Uh, and frankly, even John Kerry could have become president if something had been different in Ohio. The, the decision in Citizens United wasn't eight to one, it was five to four. A lousy decision by a guy I generally admire, Anthony Kennedy, who was a majority, uh, vote, wrote for the majority, it was only five to four. And uh, it should have been turned around uh, by being able to fill Scalia's uh, seat under President Obama. Instead, as I said, it, it was stolen. Um, so it, it, our, our, our legislation, McCain-Feingold, was made constitutional by a five to four vote. So these things are very close. They can come up again and they can uh, lead to a different outcome. Uh, people said, well, you know, our, how can you wait? Our justices are, they said this, this to me a few years ago, our justices are older and sicker, so that's not gonna work. Well, <laughs> that's not what happened. Justice Scalia passed away. And even though we got ripped off on this thing, the reality is you don't know when an opening is gonna occur, and if there was an opening, we got a Democratic president, or even a Democratic Senate this time. That could make a very different outcome on all of these issues going forward. I mean, even, even this awful decision of the FCC, in my view, uh, to make net neutrality go away on the internet was only three to two. So these aren't permanent setbacks necessarily. And this was particularly true of the campaign finance issue where after we passed McCain-Feingold, people, uh, in addition to stopping the soft money contributions, uh, people started using the internet to raise small dollar contributions, and it was fabulous. It was like electronic democracy. You know, a 90 year old woman writes into you and says, I've just given my first campaign contribution of $10. And, and you know, high school kids contributing. And then you can, you know, if they give you their information, you, you could call them up and say, hey, how would you like to come down to the office and volunteer? Uh, or, you know, sometimes they'd send cookies, which was good. Uh, so, you know, this, this is what was, was stifled, and it is not impossible to get back to the system we had at that point. It would take uh, just a few steps to make that happen if we had people in office who were willing. And frankly, it's one of the reasons on this issue, the last thing I'll say about this one, I don't get too excited about the idea of a constitutional amendment for campaign finance reform. I don't think it's a, a terrible idea, although I have been very reticent to see any amendment to the Bill of Rights. It would be the first one in the history of our country. I just think the energy and efforts that go into it are so enormous and so unlikely to prevail that it drains the energy from a lot of other things we can do to improve the campaign finance system, which I'll mention in a minute. So the second thing I mentioned is regenerating bipartisanship. And this is a cure for the hyperpartisanship, whether it be on health care or gun regulation. Uh, we have to reestablish the political power of bipartisanship. So here I'm not just talking about you know, you get enough votes on both sides, you pass a bill. I'm talking about that it's a good thing for a candidate to be able to say that they worked with somebody from the other party, to be able to use it as a campaign uh, slogan or something about uh, to do with your political posture as you run for re-election. You know, when I first ran for, for office, everybody told me, and I agreed with them, this is the one, you should put one word on your literature next to Feingold. One word. And uh, I wonder if you can guess what that is. Independent. That was the golden word uh, in Wisconsin. That they weren't sure where, you, where you'd go. You might, you're going to be a Democrat most of the time, of course. But you're capable of listening to all sides, synthesizing, and sometimes agreeing with people who disagreed with you. Um, and, and I noticed this right away when I first started my first campaign for the Wisconsin State Senate. I'd knock on the door up in these rural areas, and the first thing, you, I'm, te I'm teaching you young Virginia people right now, when you knock on somebody's door, they might not be excited to see you. <laughs> and, and so you, you use body language, and you say, hey, I'm Russ Feingold, I'm running for the State Senate, and, and I'm, just, I'm just here uh, to, to give you this, and I hope you'll read it. And, that's when they start smiling because they see you're backing away. <laughs> now, if they say, come on in and have a cup of coffee and talk to me, you go in and do it. Uh, so that, that's a technique. But here's the thing I noticed right away in 1982 in Wisconsin, which may not be true now, I'm sad to say. 
If you started flapping your jaw about Republican versus Democrat, that door was shut. We don't want to hear about that. We want to hear your ideas. I still think there's power in that. I told you that I went to every Wisconsin county every year and held a town meeting for 18 years as a U.S. Senator. I did 1,300 town meetings. And sometimes they go in very conservative areas and I went to Wapaka County, which is a great place if you ever, beautiful lakes. And the town hall meeting and about 50 people there and I get, out, get in there and I always, I would let people just basically talk the whole time. I would just say like one thing at the beginning. I said, well, you know, the, I'd usually tell them about some bill I was doing. And so the bill, I, I would say, hey, uh, one time I remember I said, I'm, I'm going to be doing a bill with Senator John McCain. Everybody started clapping, you know. I said, well, you don't even know what the bill is. <laughs> it could be to repeal the, the dairy industry or something. <laughs> and, uh, but it didn't matter because they were so attracted to the idea that, yeah, you can talk about this political party stuff, and when you get elected, we expect you to work with each other. I don't believe that that has gone uh, from the American spirit. I don't believe that people won't uh, be attracted to people who do that. I will say, of course, that the biggest problem with it is that what people, particularly conserv or moderate Republicans or conservative Republicans, if there are any moderate Republicans left, what they most fear is not losing to a Democrat. They fear being primaried out. Ask, uh, well, he's, he's passed away, but Senator Bennett of Utah, Senator Luger of Indiana was thrown out, a fine man. You know, Orrin Hatch almost got tossed out by a state convention. And so what's happened is these people get pulled uh, this way and they're afraid to work with the other side. Uh, one town meeting when everybody was yelling at me about having uh, voted for some climate change legislation, they, I said, well, Lindsey Graham was, was, was my co-sponsor. Oh, he's just a rhino. You know what that is, right? A Republican in name only. So this is what they've set up. What I think people should do is go up to any candidate and say, all right, here's the deal. I'm going to vote for you if you promise me that you're going to work with members of the other party to pass legislation. And if you can't come back to me in two years or four years or six years and tell me what legislation you co-sponsor with Republicans and what you passed, I'm not voting for you again. I mean, just be explicit that you expect bipartisanship. The last thing I'll talk about where I think there's an opportunity is, is obviously innovating and supporting and organizing state and local initiatives. We are shut out of the federal government at this moment, completely. We can do essentially nothing uh, to get uh, stuff done, so what can we do? Go back to the genius uh, of federalism, which can actually lead to pressure. And uh, you know, it's happened before. When I teach uh, my course on the United States Senate, I remind people that even though people thought it had become almost impossible to pass a constitutional amendment, the 17th Amendment was passed in 1912. 17th Amendment provided for the direct election of senators. This is not what Mr. Jefferson had in mind. That was a huge thing, a huge populist movement. Uh, and they also were able to overturn the decision, of course, of the Supreme Court prohibiting an income tax. So the, and women's right to vote. These things all happened in the same decade. So uh, that, and that activism was very much at the local level and ultimately Congress had to sort of go along and call for the constitutional amendments to be considered because they didn't want a convention to do it. So it was populist pressure that did it. People like Fighting Bob LaFollette from Wisconsin would uh, get people rallying by getting up on the floor of the United States Senate and doing something he called the calling of the roll. And then he would travel with the roll call because people couldn't get on their inter internet then and see what it was. He'd go on the back of a train and he'd say, your senators voted with the railroad men, your senators voted with the oil men, your senators voted with the timber men. And he'd let them have it. And so he would use that ability to arouse the public to do something about it. Very quickly, where, what can we do? Well, I've mentioned already on the right to vote, you know, in places like Nebraska and Alabama, people are saying it's not really right that if somebody has committed a felony and they've served their time, it's not right they should be prohibited for life from voting. Realize it's, it's I think, it, apparently a couple million people in Florida alone can't vote for this reason. What about auto, automatic uh, voter registration? 
Illinois just unanimously passed and signed by a Republican governor, automatic voter registration. We can get rid of, uh, obviously, the reapportionment. That process is, the malapportionment is already underway. And uh, I think that, the, that there's so much activity to protect the right to vote at this point that the, we can counter what has happened. Uh, and this is something that is largely left uh, to, to state law. You know, it's a, really the states are allowed to do this. Now, I, I happen to think some federal legislation in this area would be justified as well. The second I've already mentioned, the Electoral College. No, it's not going to be easy to pass uh, a constitutional amendment to get rid of the Electoral College. But there is something called the National Popular Vote Initiative. The National Popular Voter Initiative is, I think, constitutional. It would be a pact among states. Each state in that interstate agreement says, we will vote all of our electoral college people for the person who gets the most votes nationally. Now you might think this is pie in the sky, but they need 270 votes. They already have 165. Now, you wouldn't be surprised to know that California has already passed it and a few liberal states, but some other states that, that may be promising have not yet passed it, and they only need 105 more. I'm, work, I'm in Connecticut right now teaching at Yale. They are on the verge of adding Connecticut to the list. Oregon may be on the list. Arizona, Republican states, some of the Republican houses have actually passed this. It could come into being, and I believe it would survive a constitutional challenge and it would allow uh, for the popular vote to determine who the president is. And yes, uh, finally, uh, we have got to fight back on this campaign finance. I give credit to anybody that's working on con constitutional amendment, but disclosure laws in California, they just recently succeeded after five years of passing a law that requires on these initiative ad, you know, they have the, these initiatives in, in California on issues, statewide initiatives. Uh, they, the corporations were able to make up fake names for themselves, the better government, whatever. This law requires that they say exactly who they are, and it was just signed uh, by Governor Brown. Vouchers, where people are given the opportunity to spend the equivalent of $50 or $100 on the candidate of their choice, being given to everyone is being experimented with in Seattle, uh, where they are having some success with it. In Connecticut, they, a few years ago, they passed a public financing system that works very well. You, you can check it out very easily, but in the midst of all this, they actually pass something that allows candidates for state senate, assembly, governor, attorney general, to get public financing if they agree to limit how much they spend. So this is all stuff that people can work on at this point, and here's how it works. If your state does something like that, and then you're a federal official, like a, a senator, you feel pressure to do something like that at the federal level. When your state expresses the desire for reform, it's a lot harder to avoid it. To me, and to, to, to conclude, the, the one that was most exciting to me was on the night that Donald Trump was elected president, um, and he won the state of South Dakota by a huge margin. The state of South Dakota, in a referendum, voted 52-48 for a massive campaign finance reform, for vouchers, for disclosure, for lobbying control because it wasn't labeled Democrat or Republican. People just looked at it and went, this makes sense. Well, naturally the legislature figured out a way to call an emergency session at the behest of the Koch brothers and had it declared a, a, invalid as people were chanting in the galleries, shame, shame on you. I mean, South Dakota, these issues are not owned by the left, they're not owned by the right. If somehow we can cut through uh, this terrible amount of disinformation and false news and, and, and hate mongering that causes people to not just use their better instincts. So in the end, as hard as it is to be optimistic, my organization, Legit Action, is able to help, you know, help these groups do their thing in these places very easily. Something uh, that when Larry and I were a bit younger, you never could have imagined. And so they're trying to, they're trying to pass a, a, a bill in California that will allow people that have uh, committed felonies and served their time to vote. And there's going to be a community gathering in a, a small little area of Latino section of LA. And we are able to send notices from Washington or Wisconsin into people in that area and encourage them to go to that public meeting. And that would have been unthinkable. That allows for organizing. 
That allows for citizen activism that has never been possible before in the same way in human history. So as scary as the internet is, and Lord knows we're going through all kinds of adjustments, in the end, I think there is a positive populism, uh, not a plutocratic populism, but a positive populism uh, that can come from all of that. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. I'd be happy to. If that is, if that is the UVA tradition, that is what we'll do. Uh, sure, I'll be happy to. Sure. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that the, uh, the uh, nomination for the Supreme Court was essentially stolen, and indeed that was... Uh, not a violation of the law, but certainly a violation of our norms that are so important, our traditions. And uh, just wondering, do you think uh, Obama, President Obama and others uh, were sufficiently aggressive in giving voice to the criticism, or do you think more could have been said? It seems like it passed, uh, not, not quietly, but not quite, as, it seems like it's such an important thing that it didn't quite get the attention it deserved. You know, I'm not going to be quick to, to criticize uh, President Obama on this one. Uh, maybe they could have made more noise. But I'll tell you, that deal was down. I mean, Mitch McConnell announced that he wasn't going to allow this before Justice Scalia's body was cold. I mean, it was outrageous. There was no deliberation. There was no talk, and that's because the powers that be on the right, particularly those that are concerned about some of the social issues, to, him, to them this was it. I mean, if, if it took Armageddon to prevent uh, Obama from getting that fifth vote, they were willing to do it. So I'm sure McConnell got the call. That was the end of it. He was willing to destroy uh, a tradition that had been going on throughout the entire history of this country. The longest time that any Supreme Court justice had ever been delayed before was a, a guy named Louis Brandeis, who became one of the greatest justices of all time. They delayed him for 126 days. This was almost a year. And so I don't think anything would have changed it. Um, I, but I will say this, I think we were all just a bit stunned that people would put up with it. That people, there isn't that essential sense of fairness. Obama won the election, what do you mean he doesn't get to fill this seat? That, a lot of people just vote on that basis of who we're going to put on the Supreme Court. It certainly, for me, was one of the two or three things that matters most. So, you know, I, I don't think we could have stopped it. But wish we had. Um, uh, thank you for coming here today. Uh, so uh, I, my question is kind of about uh, your point on the Electoral College. Um, so a lot of people have credited President Trump win to a lot of people feel, who felt as if they were left behind by the old political establishment and not ignored. Uh, if we like kind of abolish the Electoral College and replace it with something like the popular vote, and then instead of like, for example, going to Wisconsin, we have uh, you know politicians running for president campaign in New York and California instead, uh, is that gonna, are you worried that that could be possibly a negative side effect of moving to a popular vote instead of keeping an election? That the attention would go to the large states? Yeah, so like yeah. a lot of the states where, like the Rust Belt, for example, would be a lot more ignored than it currently is. Yeah, I, you know, I, I've thought about this a lot, and I've noticed what goes on in these elections. So, and, and I've heard uh, analysts talk about it. what really happens now is um, the focus isn't on all the states. The focus is on just a few, actually, parts of certain key states. So in Wisconsin, uh, they go up to the northwest right near Minneapolis where the suburbs are that are actually in Wisconsin. They go to Green Bay. They figure, yeah, what's the point of going to Madison or Milwaukee? We know how they're going to vote. We know how they're going to vote in certain other places. And the other place to go is southwestern Wisconsin. And there's this wonderful little town called Monroe, which is a, a Swiss town. We, we, the Nationals in New Glarus, Wisconsin, is the Swiss uh, sort of national cultural heritage place for, in the United States. And John Kerry apparently really likes Limburger cheese. And he finds out that the, you, know, you can't get this everywhere, thank God. And he was down in this area so much, like he was running into George Bush at the intersections. 
And finally, he insisted on getting off the campaign bus and going into uh, Baumgartner's, which I love, and getting some Limburger cheese because he was there so much and was hearing about it. So he goes in there, eats it on the bus, and I guess the bus just stank just like pretty. <laughs> So, I mean, the level of focus on this one place, which I love dearly, is absurd. So, think about it. Do you think these guys go to Wyoming or Montana or Kansas? No. And they also don't go to New York or California now because they figured those states are done. So, they really are cut out of it. I guess the image that I think of is, wouldn't you love it if some of those moments at the end of the campaign were very moving and exciting moments that really conveyed the spirit of this country? I'm thinking of as a sad memory for me, but for those of us that loved Robert Kennedy, the last couple of days before the California primary, the way people were trying to touch him as he went through Watts, as he traveled with Cesar Chavez, that was for the primary. That kind of spirit should be part of our general election. In other words, going to places where you have strong support, but also going to other places. Look, if I was running as somebody with a strong desire for a uh, do well in the Republican states, to do, I would want to get the vote out in the Republican states. I would do a tour of states like Wyoming and Montana and others to convey through the media that I'm not taking this for granted. Uh, and it could lead to uh, an electoral difference. So, I think in the end, if you, every person's vote should count the same all over the country. And I think actually a lot of those states uh, would get more attention rather than less. Uh, first of all, Senator Feingold, I'd like to thank you for coming here. Uh, so you touched on what the 1968 campaign, how Robert Kennedy kind of like went to places that Democrats normally today don't go. And with talks about the 2018 midterms and eventually in 2020, there's a lot of argument on the left whether or not we should be focusing on trying to get these uh, former Obama Trump voters, like in rural counties in West Virginia, trying to win back the Rust Belt, or sort of take the Bernie Sanders path, go more left, energize the people that didn't come out in 2016 because they weren't excited about Hillary Clinton. And as a Democrat, what do you think would be the most effective strategy to win the House and the Senate possibly back in 2018, ultimately the White House in 2020? Well, I'll distinguish between the way that I did my work as a representative, as a senator, and an electoral strategy. I was determined to be a senator for the whole state. So I went to every county every year, even if it had 4,000 people. Actually, those are my favorite because they were almost always in these great areas, you know, the state, beautiful areas of the state. But I always thought you need to convey to people in rural areas that, who often say we never get any attention up here, you need to convey that. That's my view of how one should govern and represent. I do think the opposite, though, in terms of strategy right now, in terms of votes. I think it's, as I mentioned at the beginning, to spend all your energy trying to tell uh, the Trump voters they need to come back right now is, is not the best approach. And I don't know if it's the Bernie approach or if it's, as you say, reactivating the Obama voters or whatever it is. I can tell you that the people in our central cities and other parts of this country do not feel connected uh, very much to those campaigns. And a lot more could be done uh, to activate those votes. And that would be my first, first choice. I think it's the most likely to lead to success. I think we have some people on this side, too. Uh, Senator Feingold, uh, earlier in your speech you mentioned that Despite like the filibuster is something you still stand by, but that was sort of what allowed the stolen Supreme Court seat to be stolen in the first place. And so I was wondering if you could comment on uh, when Senator Lieberman was still in office, there was this idea of a, a staggered filibuster that he proposed, wherein that the threshold to override the filibuster would go down over time, yep. so it would not stay, yeah, the, it wouldn't stay stalwart 60. Do you think that could possibly allow the filibuster to still exist in the capacity that you support, while also preventing it from, say, perpetually preventing a Supreme Court justice from being nominated? Well, I think that's a, a, a decent idea and that could work. Um, the reality is that, you know, th there wasn't even a need to have any rules about filibusters until about the early 20th, 20th century. 
wasn't a problem in the Senate. People could speak as long as they wanted. They didn't do this sort of thing. And actually what happened was a UVA man uh, became, uh, his name was Woodrow Wilson, uh, <laughs> became very upset with various progressive senators who were opposing our entry into World War I. And uh, he, he, was, uh, he was willing to work very hard and he created, he convinced the Senate to create the cloture rule. So that was the first time that the filibusters could be cut off at all. Uh, he, says, uh, he said, I'm not gonna be controlled by a group of willful men, is, uh, referring to Bora and LaFollette and these folks. So that was the rule for a long time. And, and, and even that, of course, that had a very, uh, very negative connotation when I was growing up because of the anti-civil rights filibuster. The word filibuster was a dirty word uh, in northern homes. <laughs> um, but then what happened was Mike Mansfield, a great majority leader of the U.S. Senate, said, well, why don't we do that? If there is a filibuster going on, why don't we bring up another bill and let the filibuster continue over here? What happened with that is they created this silent filibuster or all you had to say was, I'm filibustering, and then go have lunch. <laughs> and it, just, it created a ridiculous growth. We could, that I think would be eliminating the ability to do that, to get away from the dual track would probably be the best. Although a number of very good senators proposed your idea of a sliding scale over time. Yeah, there's no limit to, to the number of things they're willing to do. The president makes up stories about fraud and, and votes, creates a, a phony electoral commission that's now gone, but now their emphasis is on the census. And what they want to do is include a question uh, in the census that asks whether you're a citizen. And this is a very uh, scary thing for many people uh, to have to you know, sort of go through this kind of process. And so they are trying to create mechanisms through the census uh, to intimidate people and to try to get them to not be included and that means a lower percentage for that area of representation. So yes, this is something that can go. There's a lot of activism, uh, lawsuits and others trying to avoid this, but they are trying to, uh, to make people very, very nervous and to try to, again, a lot of this has to do with intimidation. Uh, and the whole thing with the right to vote it is not only obviously African Americans. Um, a lot of times they just don't want a lot of uh, a lot of uh, rural people even sometimes to vote. So, <laughs> well, I, I ran into a lady about my age at, a, at an event just before the election, and, and this whole, we had passed this voter ID law in Wisconsin where you have to have voter ID. She went to visit her 91-year-old mo mother in this beautiful town in Wisconsin, and she goes upstairs, and her mother's on her knees, opening up her cedar chest looking for her birth certificate, crying, saying, I, I don't think I can vote anymore. How long does it take, do you think, for a 91-year-old to go, you know, this isn't for me? So it, it, they're trying to get into your head, and they're trying to get in the head of, of Latinos and other people who, and to say, you know, this really isn't for you. So yes, I'm very worried about it. Our group, Legit Action, is working to fight against what they're going to try to do on this. On a, on a related note, um, <clears throat> most of us know about two, three, or four of the uh, more well-publicized methods uh, newly introduced for voter suppression around the country. Um, since my sense is that your state has been less immune to this than many others, oh, yeah. uh, could, you give us, could you give us a sense of uh, the scope? You, are, you, you mentioned a couple of things just now, but um, of, and, and talk about some of the lesser known tactics yeah. that are being introduced, uh, citing Wisconsin? Yeah, I mean, this is out of the playbook of, of the Koch brothers and Alec and others, but Wisconsin has been the sort of a proving ground, of course, the voter ID. And the voter ID, of course, it has a great impact uh, sometimes on people that don't drive or people that live in poor areas. Uh, but it also, um, you know, they also after, after students. 
So, you know, we have large campuses all over the state of Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin system and others where students aren't in their own hometown and they won't allow them to use student IDs and they make it very difficult. In fact, there are a number of places in the country like New Hampshire where they're trying to pass even tougher laws to try to discourage students from voting. So that's one thing. Another thing is, you know, we had a very liberal early voting law where you could vote six weeks uh, before the election. Governor Walker and the Republicans limited it to, to two weeks. And, and gee, not on Sundays. Why do you think that is? Because in African-American churches, the ministers often uh, say, okay, now we're gonna take the souls to the polls. And they go and vote after church. What's a more patriotic thing to do than that? Well, let's not have it on Sundays. So that's an example. M moving the polling places, making the polling places really far away from your neighborhood, constricting the hours of, of the early voting polling places. So uh, there are, uh, some guy actually gave me a list of 35 of these tactics that have been developed. Uh, but I think in Wisconsin, many people believe they had a significant impact in the last election. Uh, I am told that uh, Milwaukee had possibly the highest level of drop-off of African-American voters from 2012 to 2016. I, I'm not the expert on this, but I'm told that it had an enormous uh, impact. And uh, yeah, it doesn't take a whole lot to get a, you know, a young 20-year-old, 20 21, 22-year-old to say, eh, I'm not doing this. You know, it's too complicated. I got to go to work. All right. Listen, this was great. Thanks so much. I can't believe what a great talk. I think you now see why we were so looking forward to having Russ and uh, why we knew that you would be pleased to hear him and learn from him. Um, as I did, I learned a lot to, from him, most of it depressing, but you know, I learned, I learned things from him here today. But seriously, you, you uh, gave us reasons for optimism and you gave us a path outward. And uh, for that, we're, we're grateful. Sometimes we still need these great Wisconsin progressives to come down here to the Old Dominion and to wake us up, okay? Because you can get a little sleepy around here, right? But uh, you, Russ, all I can tell you is you will always be welcome here, absolutely always. So I hope you will come back. We'll want to see you. Uh, my students who are here in campaigns and elections will have an entire evening with you and, and will be alert because no alcohol will be served. Uh, but we, again, we thank you for the effort of coming down. You've got plenty to do at Yale and elsewhere, but we enjoyed it enormously, Russ. Thank you again. Uh -uh.